dead wood isn't supposed to change your life. Yet in the hills of southern France, a simple heap of chipped branches began to glow with heat, like a fireplace that never burned. A quiet forester noticed it, measured it, and asked one stubborn question. What if decay is fuel? With no lab and no investors, he built a slow, silent power plant made of compost. It heated his home, made hot water, produced gas for cooking, and revived dry soil into gardens. Most people never learned his name. Today, we will. And the reasons it was ignored are chillingly familiar. The hot woodpile. In the mid-1970s, Jean Pain worked as a forester in the rough hills of southern France. He lived far from city comforts, surrounded by brush, pine, and dry, rocky soil. One day, he chipped a load of branches and stacked the chips in a big pile, mostly to store them. When he came back, he felt heat pouring out of the mound. Not a little warmth. Real heat, deep inside, like a stove hidden under leaves. There was no smoke and no flame just a steady pulse of warmth. He experimented. He soaked the chips with water, then left them to sit. Each time the pile started to dry, the heat faded. Each time he wet it again, the temperature climbed back up. He realized the pile was not burning. It was living. Tiny microbes were breaking down the wood with oxygen. That process is called aerobic decomposition. It is slow, but it is busy, and busy biology releases heat. Most of us treat rot as failure. Jean saw it as an engine. If a pile could heat itself for weeks, what could a bigger pile do for months? If the heat were free, could it warm a house? Could it heat water? Could it replace expensive fuel in a place where winters still bite? That strange warm mound became his blueprint. He was not chasing a new gadget. He was chasing a new kind of loop where waste turns into comfort. Goats, chips, and miracle soil. Jean and his wife lived simply on their land, managing hundreds of acres on a tight budget. When he could not afford straw bedding for his goats, he tried wood chips instead. It worked, and then it surprised him. The goats stayed healthy, and their manure mixed with the chips into a thick, dark compost. He spread it on his land, and the change was dramatic. The soil there was sandy dolomite, the kind of ground people call dead. Yet, after seasons of chip compost, it held water better and stayed cool longer. It fed roots for weeks instead of days. Plants that should have struggled started to thrive. His garden became the proof. Watermelons grew huge. Tomato vines climbed high and stayed green. Even coyote squash, which can look almost tropical, pushed through the dry dust. And the strange part was this. He did it with almost no irrigation. The compost acted like a sponge, holding moisture and storing nutrients right where roots could reach them. This mattered because it linked energy and food. The same chips that could make heat also made fertility. Jean was not separating power from agriculture. He was stacking benefits. Bedding became compost. Compost became soil. Soil grew food. And clearing brush helped the forest too. Instead of burning waste or hauling it away, he turned it into a resource that stayed on the land. That mindset set the stage for his biggest step, capturing the heat on purpose, not by accident. A law, a problem, and a new fuel. Then the French government changed the rules. New wildfire prevention laws required clear zones and brush removal in many areas. For Jean, that meant an explosion of raw material. He had to clear brushwood, branches, and small trees. And suddenly he had more chips than he could use as bedding or mulch. Most people would burn it, dump it, or pay to move it. Jean did the opposite. He soaked it and let it rot, because he already knew what rot could do. When he scaled the piles up, the heat became serious. He learned that shape mattered. A dense, rounded mound held warmth better and kept oxygen flowing just right. Too loose and it cooled. Too tight and it suffocated. He treated the pile like a living reactor, adjusting moisture, size, and airflow so the microbes stayed active. What the forest waste gave him was stability. Unlike solar, the pile did not care about clouds. Unlike wind, it did not need gusts. It worked day and night quietly, as long as biology had food and water. And unlike oil, it did not come from deep underground. It came from the brush he had to manage anyway. 
Then that was the moment the idea stopped being a clever trick. It became a plan. If he could build a compost mound that stayed hot for over a year, he could create heat on demand, using the same work that also reduced wildfire risk. He was about to turn a legal burden into his fuel supply. Inside the Biomiler. Gene called his system the Biomiler, and it was beautifully simple. He built a huge mound and packed it with about 40 tons of wood chips. Through the pile, he threaded roughly 650 feet of polyethylene pipe, like a long coil buried in a warm loaf of bread. Cold water entered one end of the loop. When it came out, it was hot, around 60 degrees Celsius, about 140 Fahrenheit. That hot water was not a demo. It was his daily life. It heated a home of about 1,000 square feet and supplied hot tap water. Not for a week, but for up to 18 months from a single build. No logs burned in a stove. No fuel tank refilled. The only input was chipped brushwood and the patience to let microbes do their work. He also pushed the idea further. In the center of the mound, he placed a sealed steel tank filled with water-soaked brushwood. In that oxygen-free space, different microbes took over and produced methane. Gene collected the gas in old rubber inner tubes, the kind you would normally throw away. This gave him a second stream of energy. Heat from the pile warmed his house. Methane from the core became fuel. What makes this so striking is the pace. A biomiler is slow power, but it is steady power. It hums without noise, without flame, and without a control panel. The machine is just a managed ecosystem, turning decay into warmth, then into usable gas, while the outer shell keeps cooking along, a compost-powered life. By the time the biomiler was mature, Jean Pan was not just testing a concept, he was living inside it. The methane he captured was enough to run an oven and a gas stove for about a year. He used some of it to feed a small generator that produced electricity. The output was modest, around 100 watts, but that can still do a lot if you store it. He charged batteries, lit rooms, and powered basic needs in a large, simple home. And yes, he even used it for transport. He modified his car to run on compressed methane stored in tanks mounted on the roof. It was not sleek, but it worked. A fill could take him roughly 60 miles. For a man living far from towns, that mattered. Cooking, bathing, lighting, and driving were all linked back to one managed pile of wood chips. Then came the final step in the loop. When the pile cooled and the energy faded, Jean did not dispose of it. He shoveled out the spent chips, now dark and crumbly, and spread them over his land. What had been fuel became fertilizer. The same material that heated water also rebuilt soil. It improved moisture, fed plants, and kept the land productive. This is why his system feels almost unreal. It did not create a new waste stream. It ended one. The brush became hot. Heat became comfort. Methane became a fuel. And the leftovers became life in the soil. It was off-grid living, but not in the lonely, survivalist way. It was off-grid living as a partnership with biology. Why it vanished, and why it matters. For a moment, it looked like the world might copy him. Journalists and scientists visited. Energy experts watched the hot water flow. A major magazine featured his story in 1981, and his book went on to sell over 100,000 copies. People called it a glimpse of the future. Clean heat, local fuel, and soil restoration in one design. But the excitement faded. Not because the biomiler failed, it worked. The problem was that it asked for things modern energy rarely asks for. It needed space. It needed a large supply of brushwood, tools to chip it, time to soak it, and patience while the pile warmed up. You could not install it in an apartment. You could not flip it on with a switch. And you could not easily build a giant industry around it, because the secret ingredient was local waste and personal effort. Governments did not champion it. Big companies could not sell it as a subscription. Compared to solar panels and wind farms, there was no obvious pipeline of profit. So the idea stayed niche, passed around by homesteaders and a few researchers, while the mainstream ran toward bigger grids and bigger machines. Yet look at the problems we face now. Wildfires are worse. Fertilizer prices swing hard. 
energy bills climb, soil gets thinner. Jean Pan's loop speaks directly to all of that. Clearing brush reduces fire risk. Compost rebuilds soil and holds water. Heat from decay can replace expensive fuels. And methane can cover cooking and backup power. Maybe the real reason it vanished is the simplest. It demanded a different kind of wealth. Not money, but attention, time, and land. And that is exactly why it still matters. Jean Pan proved that nature runs a clean reactor every day, right under our feet. Microbes eat, heat rises, gas forms, and soil is reborn. His biomiler was not a gadget you buy. It was a habit you built. That is why it scared the old system. It made power local, cheap, and hard to monetize. You may never stack 40 tons of wood chips, but the principle scales down. Capture waste, keep value nearby, and let biology do the heavy lifting. If we want real resilience, we should remember the forest furnace and use it, starting where we live.